Hi, everyone. I'm really uh, excited to be here. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I Just to give a little bit of my background, I primarily work on the problem of the origin of life. So I'm really interested in the transformation from non-living to living matter. And my background and training is in theoretical physics, so I bring that bias to the problem. Um, but fundamentally, what I've been interested in most of my career is whether there are universal laws that might explain what life is and allow us to understand this transition so that we could actually be able to predict features of the original life and study it in the laboratory. Um, and I also work on alien life detection and trying to help with NASA planning about how we do life detection on other worlds. So the theoretical framework I'm going to present is one that was developed with those problems in mind. So, you know, when we're confronted with life as we know it on Earth, it's it's maybe easier to characterize. But if we're imagining the possibilities for life in the universe, it's actually quite hard to build general frameworks that can address that problem. And also uh, this sort of core gap we have when we're working at the origin of life, um, which is that we know how to make simple molecular building blocks of life in a laboratory setting. And we understand that life is quite complex um, and maybe the simplest organisms that we know of are cellular. Um, and even you know viruses are pretty complex um, as far as the molecular complexity that they exhibit. So if we try to retrace the history of life on earth um, back toward the origin of life, we hit this sort of complexity barrier around the last universal common ancestor, which is the earliest relics of life that we can reconstruct um, with genomic data and historical data about life. And so we don't really know how to go from simple molecules to cellular life or anything that's nearly as complex as the biology that we know today. And so this has been sort of the major challenge in origin of life studies is that the steps uh, you know, that would bridge this gap are, are, are relatively unknown. So this is sort of the problem I'm most interested in is what happened um, in that intermediate uh, uh, regime of complexity before. So like, how does evolution happen before evolution? Um, and as I mentioned, um, I'm trained in theoretical physics. So when I'm confronted with problems of trying to understand fundamentally what life is, I always go back to this quote because I really feel like we don't really understand uh, fundamental physics very well when we're looking at life because it presents so many things that are um, really foundational conceptual challenges to the way we even currently frame laws of physics. So this has kind of been my perspective uh, for most of my career is that it's not just a problem of being confronted with a new kind of system, but like the the way that biology behaves is so fundamentally different than other physical systems we study that it might even require entirely new physics. Um, and so um, I like thinking about the history of fundamental laws of nature when we're confronting entirely new domains. And so I often think about sort of major advances in physics in terms of unifications. And so these are this list actually comes from Frank Wilczek, who's a Nobel laureate um, uh, for his work on QCD. Um, and so all of the ones on this list are actually ones that he had on his list, except for the last one about computation and matter, which I added to the list. Um, but if you look at these kind of major transitions in the way that we understood um, the way reality works, uh, oftentimes the way we understand phenomena before looks radically different after a unification than it did before. So for example, terrestrial and celestial physics was unified in the time of Galileo and Newton. And before that, you know, like people were describing motion in terms of um, all kinds of sort of what would seem to us very colloquial and, um, you know, not very uh, rigorous ways. Um, you know, if you go back to the ancient Greece, they thought, you know, every material property had different kinds of motion associated with it. Um, and so uh, I, I think it's really important to kind of think about, you know, when we're talking about frontiers like physics of life, if, if there are kinds of unifications and what they would look like. And the one I'm going to talk about in um, in my own work is really thinking about the nature of information and how information actually might be material and living things and, and what that actually looks like, that there's some kind of unification between computation and matter. When you get to complex chemical systems, that becomes a really apparent physics. Um, so the problem that we're confronted with in biology uh, in general, and this looks like a chemical problem. So I work a lot in the field of chem informatics, which is you know, about drug design and drug discovery and trying to iterate over the space of possible molecules that might be drug candidates. So the molecule I'm showing here is taxol, which is derived from the yuku tree, yuku, I don't know how to pronounce that actually, yuku tree, um, but it's, a, it's used as an anti-cancer drug. It's not a very big molecule. Um, it has a molecular weight of about 100, 
or 853. Um, but if you wanted to iterate over this molecular formula to build all possible unique structures um, that have that chemical formula, the number of structures you would build would fill a volume about 1.5 universes of material with one copy of each molecule. So this is just to give an idea of how big chemical space is. I think people look at like the Hubble Deep Field and they think the universe is large, but we don't even like really have a firm conceptualization of how large the space of possible molecules is, even for small molecules, let alone larger molecules that life builds or cellular structures. Or when you get to things like technology, it's a it's an exponentially growing space as things get more and more complex. And so this space is absolutely huge. So then the question becomes, why does something like taxol exist on our planet and not these other possibilities? Um, so that's the question of evolution and selection. But also it becomes very apparent when you're studying biological materials that in many cases, ensemble approaches don't work because you can't iterate over every possible structure and build an ensemble of 1.5 universes for just one molecule. Um, and so, um, so these are some of the sort of, uh, you know, deeper conceptual problems we have to deal with. And then on the other side of it, um, I've always been sort of... Uh, interested in one key feature of living systems, which is that they seem to change the rules as they evolve, right? So that so some people will talk about this idea of state dependent rules and biological forms or self-referential dynamics. Um, and this is something that I think we've known for a long time that biology seems to have slightly different rules than say what Newtonian physics uh, alluded to. So uh, Darwin actually even said this um, when he tried to juxtapose you know, the fixed law of gravity, which is described with an initial condition and a fixed dynamical law for all time and the generative process of our biosphere, which seems to generate endless forms and new rules and new and the, the forms that get generated generate actually new complexity and new layers and, and new kinds of um, uh, actual emergent laws in some sense. Um, so it gets very hard to describe biology um, with the kind of paradigm that we have in physics. And it is a paradigm. So if you look at any theory of physics that we have right now, they're almost universally cast in terms of an initial condition and a fixed law of motion. Um, and those kind of systems aren't ones that can generate information over time. Um, and so this is one of the key paradoxes associated with trying to understand how life could be understood at sort of a more fundamental level. And in most cases, we don't have to worry about this, but I think the origin of life, you're really confronted with it because you're asking how molecules as they start to emerge more complex structure can actually generate information and in the particular evolutionary trajectories we observe. Um, so when it comes to talking about the origin of life problem itself and what I'm actually interested in solving uh, before I get to the theory that's going to kind of tie all this together, um, you know, traditionally, a lot of people have been focused on making those molecules that I mentioned in the introduction, like simple, small molecule chemistry. Um, I don't think that's actually the problem we need to solve. And I think, in fact, we've been putting too much selection in those experiments because we kind of pre-design the output. We, we know what molecules we want to make. So um, the sort of framework I'm operating in is that we should do kind of a blind exploration of chemical space. And we actually have the technologies coming online to be able to do that. So one of my key collaborators on origin of life uh, research in my lab is uh, Lee Cronin and his group at the University of Glasgow. So Lee's um, the one that you know really started the work on assembly theory because he was trying to actually solve the problem of if I had a robot that was exploring chemical mixtures in the lab, how would I know that they became alive? Um, and so the sort of vision we have is building a very large scale experiment that would explore lots of different chemical mixtures and, and be able to observe the evolution of life forms before we had an evolutionary architecture that we would recognize with the genetic material. Um, so this is sort of the first uh, slide actually formally introducing the ideas of assembly theory. And I just want to say that what we're really trying to do is understand if you are ex blindly exploring chemical space, um, as I mentioned, the possibility space is huge. So 1.5 universe is just for taxol, and that's not a very complex molecule. So if you're building up complexity um, or you're trying to build up molecules and you have no constraints and no selection, what happens in prebiotic chemistry experiments is you get tar because without selection that you have a combinatorial explosion of possibilities. Um, and basically you don't get abundance of any kind of particular configuration. And so what we are interested in when we're studying the transition to life is how do you get high complexity molecules in high abundance and how do you actually produce them reliably? And so the way that we conceptualize that is actually to think about the chemical universe as one that's exponentially expanding as you're adding more bonds or increasing the size of the molecules. And there's a threshold in that space above which you can't produce molecules unless they're produced by selection. 
um, and evolution. And so they become evidence of an evolutionary process. And the key feature of this from the fundamental physics perspective that I'm interested in is that the description that we provide with assembly theory actually unifies this sort of two dichotomous views that um, Darwin was pointing out in his work, which is this idea that we have um, a production time. So once objects are formed, you kind of have a reliable set of laws that can describe them. So for example, we can describe population genetics or all kinds of things in sort of like a standard dynamical systems framework. Um, uh, with a fixed law and initial condition, but we can also talk about novelty generation and where the, do these new initial conditions and new possible rules come from within this sort of framework. Um, and so what is the structure of assembly theory? Um, the idea that we have in mind is to try to think about actually the causation that builds uh, complex objects. And so you can think about these graphs as, as representing molecules. Uh, sometimes I actually have like Lego castles and, and things like that on this to kind of show this sort of idea of stepwise building of complex structures. Um, but the basic premise of it is if you start from elementary building blocks like bonds, you can um, make a sort of structure that might be you know, a fragment of a molecule. And then once that structure is made, it can be used again to reproduce another, to produce another structure and start to build stepwise up into the space of possible configurations. Um, and so what the way we formalize that sort of stepwise procedure and the measurement of this kind of recursive building of the space is using this idea of the assembly index. And the assembly index is supposed to represent the minimal number of steps where you're using past history to build the object. And the other important feature of the theory that also is measurable is this idea of copy number, which is how many of the object have you observed. So if you have a one-off, very complex object, it's very likely that evolution maybe didn't produce that. Um, but if I have a high abundance of say DNA, um, you know, like that's something that evolution uniquely can produce. Um, so, uh, so this is sort of just a way of formalizing how hard it is to actually build this particular configuration of matter in terms of the historical contingency involved in the process. How much did you have to constrain the space to construct that specific set of objects? Um, and so we have this, this particular way of formalizing it with this assembly equation that's exponential in A and, and linear and copy number. Um, but you'll note like if there's only one copy of something, it doesn't contribute to the assembly. Um, <laughs> So there's a few things that I'm really, so this is actually an example of an assembly space for a molecule. So this is adenosine. Um, and one of the features that I'm super, so adenosine is obviously a pretty simple molecule. It has an assembly index of seven. But one of the features of the theory that's critically important is that this particular uh, constraint in chemical space is sort of unique to the structure of adenosine. And you can actually treat this causal structure, this sort of graph that is the, the informational graph that produces adenosine scene as an object in the theory. It's actually the feature of the theory that is physical because it's the one that we measure in the lab. Um, and I think, uh, so, and I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that I'm really interested in sort of foundational physics and this idea of com uh, computation and matter kind of being the same thing. And this is actually how it manifests in the theory. Like you think about physical molecules as computational objects. Um, the reason that I think this is significant is we kind of lose sight in the history of physics, um, you know, that things like mass and electric charge and all of these variables that we think of as being very physical had to be invented for the theories that they were developed for um, based on the kind of measurements that we could take at the time. So we always start like with a measurement and we build an abstraction from the measurement and then we're able to formalize laws that describe those kind of measurements. And in assembly theory, this feature of this space um, is actually measurable. So I'll show that on the next slide. Um, but also we think it's predictive. So we think most of the evolutionary uh, history is already um, in a causal sense, not in like a historically, this is what happened sense is already embedded in the space and we can actually use it to make predictions. And we do use the structure of this space actually to even build phylogenetic trees for metabolism, which is a paper I'm not gonna talk about, but it will be hopefully be out soon. Um, so um, so this is the measurement system. Uh, so I, I actually, I won't present results for NMR and infrared, but there was a paper from Lee's lab out recently that demonstrated that you can measure molecular assembly index with three different modalities of measuring devices. And probably you can do it with Raman too, but it just hasn't been validated yet. Um, but the idea is if you have this kind of stepwise procedure of making a molecule and you do it by this minimal path, that structure actually correlates with the fragmentation pattern in a mass spec. And so there's a sort of a direct correspondence between the assembly structure of the graph and the what we get in the mass spec. And you can also do it, um, as I mentioned, in NMR and infrared. 
Um, and so a couple of years ago now, we had this paper out in Nature Communications that basically did this for a whole bunch of non-living and living samples and confirmed that there's this, this sort of selectivity phase transmit transition actually happens in chemical space of living and non-living things. So um, even with blinded samples from NASA, we were able to show that we uh, don't see any molecules above a sort of critical threshold. Uh, that happens to be 15 for the samples that we observed. I think it might not universally be 15, and it might be 15 for different assembly spaces. One of the things that my lab is doing is trying to generalize the theory to things beyond molecules. Um, and we have a lot of preliminary results that a lot of the structure of the, the math and everything works for different kinds of systems. Um, but this phase transition is actually the thing that I'm most interested in formalizing, because I think if we understand what happens at that sort of scale of chemical complexity, um, that life is the only thing that can produce something larger than it, then we can actually have some new mathematical frameworks for approaching the origin of life problem in a rigorous way, um, which is what I'm most keenly interested in. So this is sort of a conceptualization um, of the assembly space. Again, that was in our paper that came out um, in the fall. And um, the sort of idea is that you have like these nested universes of increasing constraints that selection applies on the space of possible objects. And so the assembly universe is, is the one with no constraints. So that would be sort of the one I presented with taxol, you know, just for the taxol molecule, the size of the layer that taxol exists in just for that one molecular formula is 1.5 universes of material. Um, but I didn't impose any constraints on what bonds are actually possible uh, to form um, in the, the sort of tax all space. So there would be an actually a smaller constrained space, which is actually incredibly difficult to calculate. That would be what we define as assembly possible. So you actually add physical constraints on which, which objects can exist. But even assembly possible is much larger than the space we actually observe. Um, and so the things that we expect to observe in evolution are the ones that are actually in this sort of assembly contingent space where they can only be built up by this recursive use of parts that have already been built. Um, and the conjecture we have is that to pass that phase transformation line, you have to have a historically contingent pathway. So this recursivity and reuse of parts in the structure of complex objects is actually really fundamental to how evolution can even produce them. Um, and we always start from this kind of idea of looking at the objects we observe, breaking them apart to build the space, and then looking how much the space was constrained to select for that configuration objects, which is how we, we actually quantify the causation and selection in the objects. And just to clarify, I think people get really confused about the use of selection in assembly theory. We mean it in a really constructive sense, like the universe is actually constructing the possibility space as it goes on a planet, and this is the process we call evolution. And selection is not just this sort of passive filter that we've traditionally thought about, but it's actually actively constructed by objects constraining other objects to, to be able to allow certain things to exist and not others. Um, okay, let's see. Um, so going back to this sort of idea of the origin of life transition, I think what assembly theory is offering is a way about how you could actually have some symmetry breaking in the, the sort of um, historical contingency of building up these parts of molecules that allows constraints to be built up over time and, and, and to describe this transition. So this is sort of fundamentally the problem that I'm interested in is that if we have an unconstrained chemical reaction system, we get a combinatorial ex explosion and undirected exploration of the space. And something happens at the origin of life so that we get like, this sort of directed um, construction in a particular uh, direction of increasing complexity. Um, and something that I think a lot of us in biology aren't accustomed to thinking is we think like the original life was an event that happened in the past. Um, but this physics is actually really general and should happen in any combinatorial space. Um, that's uh, where where memory is necessary to produce particular objects. So I think like if you think about um, you know, the structure of human languages, they reuse a lot of parts of the language. And why do we have like sort of complex construction of sentences and things is because we reuse parts. So there is this sort of phase transition that happens in any random combinatorial space where the structure actually has to be above this sort of uh, complexity threshold. Um, and so this sort of process of the original life might be actually much more general. And this is something that people in the complex systems community think uh, quite a lot about. Uh, David Krakauer and uh, Chris Kempis had a wonderful paper a couple of years ago about multiple paths to multiple life and that the original life was a continuous transformation. Um, and so I think, I think this physics is very general. 
Um, some of the things I worry about are <laughs> what's fundamental. Um, and so I, I like to point out, um, you know, because I think people will have a challenge with this idea that, um, you know, maybe information is actually the fundamental substrate of evolution in the sense of like these assembly spaces are these causal graphs. And this is actually the physical space if you want to talk about this sort of deeper ideas about how life emerges from matter. Um, and I just I, I like to point out that um, the things that we define as fundamental are actually historically contingent. They're like a social feature of the evolution of the progress of science. So a good example is that we used to call atoms. Uh, well, we do call atoms atoms because we once thought they were indivisible. But obviously, as our technology developed, we realized that they were made of protons, neutrons and electrons. And string theory is currently, you know, thought to be the best candidate of a new fundamental theory. But we don't accept it yet because we don't have the technology to actually resolve features at that scale. Um, and so a lot of our ability to understand the world around us is contingent on and co-evolving the technology with the theories. And I think this is critically important when we're talking about the nature of life, because, you know, life is in front of us and all around us. And we, we feel like we understand it, but we might not have the right sort of resolution or measurement to really resolve the features that are, are the ones that are most important for this sort of more universal view of what life is and what it's doing. Um, and so um, I'm going to kind of try to wrap up because I think I only have a few minutes left. Um, but I, you know, this is kind of more of a visualization of this idea of like, uh, you know, looking for aliens in the lab. So I mentioned about the Hubble Deep Field um, and, you know, exploring chemical space, I think is a more promising approach to look for alien life. So I, I sit on, you know, like com committees for Hub Worlds Observatory and, and things like that, like looking for life on exoplanets. I think it's critically important. But I think the real problem of solving the origin of life is something we have to do in the lab. And it's going to require exploring chemical space in a systematic way. Um, so, you know, thinking about the history of, the, of, of our understanding of, of the universe itself and how we understand, you know, the Hubble Deep Field is this tiny little image on our night sky. Um, and we have this sort of history of the universe going all the way back to the Big Bang. So we can kind of, in some sense, talk about the origin of our universe, although it's earlier, it's hard to go earlier than the Big Bang, obviously. It's kind of nonsensical in some sense. Um, uh, you know, we build we build experiments, though, on Earth to try to talk about these features and try to push deeper. Um, and I think what the challenge is with the origin of life is we have this huge chemical space um, and our biosphere, this is sort of all of the metabolisms, uh, re metabolic reactions that are encoded and keg drawn as one network. So this is sort of like the planetary chemistry of life on earth. It's a tiny, 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 tiny uh, piece of chemical space. And this is what evolved on our planet. Um, but the question is if we built a large enough experiment uh, exploring potential chemical spaces, could we actually see sort of a new cascade of complexity emerging out of the experiment in the sort of same sense that we had like a biological Big Bang on Earth? Um, and so this is sort of going back to what I introduced at the beginning. But we really need the theory to guide the search. So the idea of looking for this is like high assembly configurations of matter in these experiments, I think, is really promising. And this is just some experimental data, um, you know, along with the, the conceptual view that if you actually introduce molecules um, and you subject them to different environments, you don't reproduce the exact same results every time, but you do kind of end up in the same region of chemical space. So some features of these sort of agnostic searches for complexity and chemistry are reproducible, but not all of them. So the historical contingency might get, uh, you know, a particular kind of molecular configuration, but the environmental constraints of the minerals and things will tell you what region of chemical space you're in. And so this is some of the exploration we're doing now um, and trying to actually formalize the amount of constraints we put into original life experiments as far as thinking about, you know, you have complexity in with the molecules that you start with, the prebiotic chemistry, and you have the complexity out as far as the molecules you generate. Um, but we don't actually formalize the constraints that we put in the experiment, how much selection we do as experimenters on these experiments. So we're trying to figure out ways to formalize that, which allows you to actually build standards for original life experiments that can compare genetics and metabolism, for example, which has been unheard of in our field. Um, so I think this is an incredibly exciting application. Um, and then this is just sort of another one, <laughs> thinking about actual experiments is, is looking for assembly um, in behavior of oil droplets. So one of the projects that I'm really excited about, um, this is data from Lee's lab, but we have a project to try to look for goal-directed behavior or the emergence of agency in oil droplets. And a que the question again becomes how much is the behavior selected and, and can you actually detect early signatures of selection in these systems? 
Um, so with that, I'm going to thank my lab. They're amazing. Uh, we did not plan to dress as a rainbow. It was spontaneous. Um, they're, they're fantastic. And um, I already mentioned Lee a couple of times, but I'm really grateful uh, for him as a collaborator. And Chris Kempies and Michael Lockman uh, at SFI have been really critical to development of theory. 